again. Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 25. And it reads this. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is, and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10 uh, with 10,000 men to oppose the coming against him with 20,000 if he is not able he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace in the same way any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple salt is good but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You may be seated. Amen. If I had to title the text, I hope you have a pen and a piece of paper if you don't. Have a piece of paper, take that lovely program that's meant for you to write on the back of it. Write on that thing and keep it. If you don't have a pen, borrow a pen from your neighbor. If I had to title this text, I'd like to title it, The Price of Admission. The Price of Admission. Uh, the Holy Spirit uh, had, had blessed me with this text to talk about uh, the price of admission. Um, uh, the reason why it came to mind is uh, actually, uh, this might sound crazy, I was watching, uh, I was watching television and I was watching uh, a reality, uh, not a reality show, but a Fox show, it was called Empire. And I was watching Empire and the, the season finale it was two hours long and in the season finale, I mean, they just disrespected the church so bad. Oh I mean, the church, I mean, Talk about the church getting the black eye. And if, and if you're out there on any type of social media, uh, whether it's Facebook or whatever, everyone said how much they loved it, how they're excited about it. But very few people talked about the disrespect that was received by the show. I mean, and, and I'm going to tell you something. Uh, honestly, I find that, yes, Empire is, 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 is very, very entertaining. Uh, uh, but saying that, so is scandal, and you see what that is about. I mean, the title itself gives it away. Uh, but the blatant assault on the church and God was downright offensive. Let me let me let me let me explain to you uh, how offensive it was. Okay. It was so offensive. Uh, the character of Lucius lying. He says uh, he says he's God, and then Snoop Dogg. Uh, retorts back and said, well, he's God, I'm Jesus. Wow. Um, it was so blatantly offensive that the only Christian character that had been on the show, which is Jennifer Hudson, a choir, a, a choir songstress who was a devout counselor and in the church, she flipped the script so bad when the opportunity of fame came, not only did she take the opportunity of fame, but she was introduced as a gospel singer, but by the end of the show, she was singing, white girls drop it like it's hot, black girls drop it like it's hot, in a, in a pure white dress, and everybody around her was dressed in black. If that weren't enough, <laughs> if that weren't enough, it goes on even further, <clears throat> where uh, the character Lucius Lyon, he said to his son who was trying to give his life to the Lord, but yet still weak. He tells his son, I'm going to show you who is more powerful, your God or me. 
and he ends up turning the church uh, into a harlot because they were excited about the fame that Lucius could give wow. and not about the excitement of praising God. So it led me to uh, this particular uh, wow. this particular sermon about the price of admission. And it had me thinking, what are we willing to pay? What are we willing to give for the price of admission unto heaven? If it costs to be a part of this world, if it costs you your integrity, if it costs you your faith, if it costs you your loved ones, if it costs you blood, sweat, and tears, the price of admission, what is the price of admission to get into the kingdom of God? Far too often, we are willing to pay whatever price the world puts out for any old thing. I think about the ridiculous price that the world puts on tennis shoes. There's a particular brand of tennis shoe called Jordans. And for whatever reason, we got knuckleheads that are willing to steal a truck. Uh, no, no, not, not even, listen, listen, before it can get to the store, let me, let me tell you what they do. They would steal a truck full of Jordans. This is a common thing that a doggone shoe truck has to be protected by armed guards because knuckleheads will steal train shipments and somebody nod their head because they like, it happens all the time. They will steal the truck or the train that tennis shoes are on just because it's that valuable to them. And not only will they wear them, but they want to steal it so they can sell them on the street for full price, if not double, because of the rarity of the tennis shoe, wow. which we call Jordan. Jordan, a person who don't even play in the league anymore, but people still want to wear his shoes. And the cost that they are willing to pay is they would rather risk going to jail, Ooh. being shot, Ooh. or hijack a train for some tennis shoes. Wow. That's the kind of cost they are willing to pay in this world. And if that ain't enough, I'll still stay on the shoes. Some of us, if we don't have family members or ourselves, we're willing to stand out in line all day, all night, camp out for the cost of some titty shoes because they only have so many in your size. They ain't a plethora. It's not an affinity amount of size 10s or 12s or 6s, whatever you wear. So folks will camp out at night for the cost of some LeBron James or some Michael Jordans just so they can be the first ones to have a pay. They'll miss work, they'll miss school, all to pay the price to wear some apparel. A shoe that is, that is, that is, that is worth less than a dollar. It takes less than a dollar to make a pair of Jordans. I want y'all to know something. The Jordans are made overseas in sweatshops and it costs less than a dollar. I think last time I checked it was like 89 cents. It's like 89 cents US dollar to make a pair of Jordans. And over here, we're paying two and three hundred dollars plus for some tennis shoes. The cost, the cost, the cost. When we look at this particular text, we find that there is a large crowd traveling, following Jesus Christ. Well, we start at verse 25 and say, well, 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 how did the crowd come to follow Jesus Christ? If you look prior to the text, I'm just going to glean over just a little bit. Uh, in chapter 14, uh, starting with verses 1 through 5, Jesus was invited to a prominent Pharisee's home to eat. Mm -hmm. You have to understand something that the Pharisees have been trying to catch Jesus up. They've been arguing with Jesus. They have been his number one adversary against him trying to trip him up in, in, in the law, trying to discredit him. They were jealous of the following. They were jealous of the teaching and the knowledge that he had. They felt that he didn't have the credentials nor the pedigree to be leading and, and guiding people. Some of y'all might get that at work there. Somebody might say that you don't have the education, the knowledge or the pedigree to be given orders and nobody should take orders from you. They felt this same way about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But yet, it's still the very people who talk so bad about them. It seems like the people who talk about you the most, they want to be around you the most for some reason. I want you to realize they're talking about you because it's something peculiar about you. There's something special about you. And you lure people to you. 
See, I want you to understand that, that the Holy Spirit inside of you, it is a light. That's why Christ said, talk about light, that he's the light of the world. That light shines within you. And there's something funny about light. Even when I look at bugs at nighttime when I got the porch light on, that, that, that every time, no matter, no matter how many dead bugs that are around the porch, and no matter how many dead bugs are in that lamp, the, you would think that a fly would see all them other dead flies and it would not go to the lamp, but it's something that brings them to the light. You would think that after a while, the devil would stop messing with God's children and will realize to see how many people fail to try to thwart God. But it's something about the light, whether good, bad, or indifferent, people are drawn unto it. Yes, sir. We look at chapter 14, starting at the uh, first few verses, that, that, that Jesus was invited to a prominent Pharisee's home. Notice it uses the, uh, uh, the adjective prominent in front of the name Pharisee, that this was somebody who had some clout, that this was somebody who had some uh, position, that this was a well-known person, brings them, invites them over, brings them over to the house. Yeah. And they tried to trick him. I want you to know that people are always going to try to trick you in life. I want you to know people, people want your money, people want your work because they want to trick you in this world. You have to understand for the price of admission, you know, when I think about, when I think about movies, I, I, I love going to the movies. The best part of going to the movies is the previews because sometimes the previews can trick you. The previews make a movie look so good sometimes, y'all. And I mean, you're excited about it. You're waiting for the movie to come out. You done seen that preview for three months. You're like, oh, girl, wait till I go see. I'm going to go see this movie. I've been looking at these previews, and it's amazing. The preview's been on TV. And it lures you in to get your money because it wants you to pay the price to come see it. Amen. In life, in life, in life. People might look attractive and positions might look attractive. It only wants to lure you for you to sacrifice something or to render or give something unto it so it can draw you close and draw you near. Wants to take from you. It doesn't want to give you anything. It wants to take from you. Here in the biblical text, we started at chapter 14. A prominent Pharisee invites Jesus. What I love about Jesus Christ, Jesus, Jesus accepts the invitation uh, sometimes, sometimes uh, when people have uh, Ill, Ill wishes and ill feelings upon our lives and they mean us uh, harm, they will sometimes try to bait us into certain situations. Also, they can take from us. Also, they can extract and make us sacrifice something. But what I love about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he took this opportunity to flip the script on them. Sometimes in life, Christians, y'all got to play offense and I always play defense all the time. Sometimes, Christians, we are so defensive that we don't take an opportunity to be offensive. Every now and then, God, God doesn't always play defense. I want you to know that you serve a God that you can be offensive sometimes. Yes, sir. The enemy is always, it seems like, is playing offense and we're just reacting to everything the enemy does. It almost seems like if the enemy wasn't throwing us nothing in our way, that we wouldn't do nothing at all because all we do is stand in defense. But Jesus Christ got this invite and he said, I'm going to play offense and I'm going to on the Sabbath. And they had the nerve to try to trick him. And there was a man with dropsy there. Now I want you to know something that we always talk about the healing of the man with dropsy. But the fact of the matter is, he was planted there uh -huh. to abstract an uproar and cause confusion. Some people who have misery in their life, they are planted in your life just to bring you down and take you down as well. All right. That man wasn't there in the text, in the text. It wasn't so much that he was there seeking Jesus. It was a setup that the Pharisees brought them in just to lure Jesus into a trap. Sometimes people's situations and circumstance is a lure, y'all. It's a lure to get you all wrapped up emotionally. It's a lure to get you off task. It's a lure to get you hyped, more hyped about their situation than you are. Y'all have to realize that. Sometimes at the price of admission, you might find yourself in a whirlwind of trouble and you need to be ready to handle the adversity. You need to be ready not only to handle the adversity, but you are on display because people want to see if you're going to really be you when the going gets tough. That's it. That's it. That was the issue. That was the issue. Amen. That's the issue that we're looking at with the price of admission right now. Sometimes we pay to be involved in this world so much 
And then when we get there, we realize that we have to not only pay a physical price, right. but we find ourselves paying a spiritual price and an emotional price and a faith-based price just to be a part. Amen. Fact of the matter is, y'all are not only paying the price, but we as Christians, we are starting to sell, not start, we've been selling out. Yeah. How have y'all been selling out? Y'all been selling out because Barack Obama was black. Y'all decided to go with everything that that man done seen. Y'all know good and well if the president was a different ethnicity, y'all jokers wouldn't have sold out like y'all sold out. I'm going to tell the truth. Some of y'all might be political fans. I'm a fan of Jesus Christ. I'm not a fan of Republican or Democrat. I'm a fan of what's right and what's wrong. Fact of the matter is, some of us, we talk about selling out. Y'all want to pay this price. Y'all want to hang around certain people and, and talk about certain things that you know you're not about. Our right. right, young people, you know, you know, you know good and well, young people, if you're not about that life of drinking and smoking and thugging, you don't need to condone that type of conversation nor be in that type of environment. Amen. That's right. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you know if you got friends that's going around uh, 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 messing up marriages, jacking up homes, All beating right. up children, cussing folks out at work, you know you're not about that life. You know you wouldn't want nobody to do that to you. Don't sell your morals out just to be a part of what everybody else is doing, just to be admitted. Right. You see in the biblical text of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, he came, he came, and when he saw the setup, he didn't wait for them to try to ask him anything. He immediately questioned them, and he, he, he had to tell them. He said, now listen here, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? <laughs> had to realize he asked them the question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Because they wanted to try to trap him to see if he would ask the permission to heal this man of dropsy. I want you to know something, that even when people try to set you up, that if you do what God will have you to do, their setup can be their blessing and their eye-opening experience on how good God is to them and will be to them. You have to allow God to use you in a mighty way. Even with those people that try to hurt or harm you, you still got to be about the Father's business. Yes, sir. The Bible says that even though they try to set him up, he healed the man with dropsy. Dropsy uh, uh, is, is basically extra fluid that's in your body tissue uh -huh. and it's also in your body cavities. And it's an indicator that either you have some type of cancer or you have some uh, abnormal dysfunction on the inside with your kidneys. Okay. And so he either had a kidney uh, failure issue or he had cancer. But nonetheless, the Bible said that Jesus okay. took hold of him. Yeah. I want you to realize that in your situations when people want to bring you in to their admittance. Uh -huh. After you done paid a price, I want you to understand something that you allow God to be God and you stay firm and true to who you are because Jesus Christ will take hold of the situation. Even if you find yourself tricked in life, if you be you in Christ Jesus, Jesus will take hold of the situation, took hold of the situation and healed the man. And then he laid down the gauntlet and said, now suppose that this was your family member, or suppose that this was your ox, suppose this was your business, or suppose that this was your family and affected you, would you have not done something about it? I want you to realize that Jesus is on the offense to let the enemy know that here you want me to sell out, but I just want to love you and you should just give in to the will of the Father. Yes. If that weren't enough, Jesus, being invited, stood at the Pharisee's house. They would talk about seating arrangements, and everybody picked a good seat. Everybody wanted to sit close to the most prominent people. Yeah. Jesus had to tell them in the next verses, verses 7 through 14, that, 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 that don't worry about taking the best seat in the house. The best seat in the house should not be taken by you, but it should be given unto you. Yeah. Some of us in life all the time, we, 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 we want the best seat in the best place in the house. And the fact of the matter is, Jesus said, you're going to embarrass yourself if you think you're the best and you're really not. All right. You'll find yourself in a precarious place that if you appoint yourself the self-champion, if you appoint yourself as the best looking, the smartest, and the most talented, you might have egg on your face when you realize that there's someone out there that is better than you because, not because the world says so, because they are worthy of it. All right. The Bible says, let the host of the house decide who will have the best seat. Let God decide. Let God elevate you and exalt you and not man and not yourself. That one enough in the same house, in the same place. Yes. There was a lot going on in this prominent Pharisee's yes. house. 
somebody had the nerve to say, blessed is the man who eats at the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, now, wait a minute. Let me tell you about the feast of the kingdom of God. That these people that are there at the kingdom of God at this great banquet, he said that there were people that were invited, but they made excuses. I want you to realize that also, too, there is a price to pay, but also, too, we need not make excuses when God wants to admit us and bring us and draw us closer unto him. Some of us today, we have all kind of excuses in our life why we're not in church. Some of y'all family members have all kind of excuses why they're not fellowshipping with God. And I want you to know right here in the biblical text, it talks about it right here. I can't make this stuff up. Verses 15 through 24, it talks about these ridiculous excuses that are made. What excuses was made? One person said, oh, they just bought a field. That means that they had some land and some property. They said, I got to do some housework so I can't come to church and praise God. I want you to realize that if it was not for God, you wouldn't have no house. There wouldn't be no work to be had. And that's just a terrible, lazy excuse. Another guy said, I got five yokes of oxen. That means he just brought him some new toys and he wanted to play with his new toys. And so he didn't have time to give God some glory, thanks and praise. But I want you to know if God didn't give you a job and God didn't make provisions for you, you wouldn't have five yokes of oxen. You wouldn't have no car. You wouldn't have no motorcycle. Heck, you wouldn't even have eyes to see and wheels to push on the pedestal gaze. He said, also another one made excuses and said, well, I just got married, and I want you to know something, that that, that, that joker, that man or that woman can change their heart today or tomorrow. Just because you just got married, that don't mean you get to lay up in bed, get your freak on all day and night, but you don't have no time to praise God. He said, these people were invited, but they was just too busy. He said, but there is room up in heaven. Bible talks about at the same place at a prominent Pharisee's house. Yes. Jesus was on a whirlwind right here. Yes. He said that, that, that it will be people who don't make excuses. They might be poor. They might be on the side of the road. Yes. But they decided to make Jesus yes. their choice. And they decided to come on to yes. church. That means they wanted to teach Sunday school. Yes. They wanted to attend Bible study. They yes. wanted to go to the nursing home. They wanted to think about somebody else other than yes. themselves. And even when they had work to do, they I don't need the overtime on Sunday. I need the time to praise my Jesus Christ. Because it wouldn't be a job at all for overtime if it had not been for God. Said, I got to come to church because if I want to keep my marriage, I need to be in church and I need to know how to love my husband and love my wife. And if you're single, you need to know how to be a good woman and be a good man so you can obtain such things. It says there was room for those people, and they were at the feast of kingdom of God. Yeah. And after he preached at this prominent Pharisee's house, mm. they tried to trap him and arrest and kill him. The Bible says now the scene has changed. I believe in my Holy Ghost imagination, he interrupted that dinner. He interrupted that dinner in such a way that it was impactful to each and every person that was sitting at the table. The Bible says in verse 25 that a large crowd was traveling with Jesus. Ain't it something how the crowd was once against you? But as long as you stood by what you were about, as long as you kept Christ in your life, now the atmosphere changed where Jesus Christ reigns supreme. You changed the hearts and the minds of our brothers and sisters. You changed the hearts and minds of your friends, families, and loved ones. If you don't sell out, just to be admitted into the world. Mm. Bible says that now things have changed. Mm -hmm. And now where Jesus was invited to the prominent Pharisee's house, now he is away from the Pharisee's house, and now the people are following oh, him. Yeah. Don't you think that if you decide to make Jesus your choice and quit selling out at work, quit selling out around your friends, that you will change their hearts, that they will turn in their bad tickets that they bought in the world, and they will cash it in and say, I want to pay the price yeah. of admission to be with my Lord yeah. and Savior, that I want to pay the price, and I want to be in the kingdom of God. Yeah. Well, some of y'all might think yeah. it's just so simple. The Bible says that Jesus realized that the crowd was following. I believe that he was walking on down the street, yeah. and he looked back over his shoulder, and he saw a few people, and he kept on walking, and he heard more footsteps, and he looked back to the other shoulder and saw yeah. even more people. Yeah. Yeah. And as he kept on walking, something hit him. He realized that all these people can't yeah. truly be real followers. Some of y'all that come to 
church. Just because y'all behinds are in the seat, that don't mean that y'all really love my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Maybe like I do. So that's why Jesus had to stop walking. Sometimes you got to stop walking so you can give people a reality check. Sometimes you got to let people know what they are purchasing. Jesus didn't want to sell folks wolf tickets because some of the people thought that they were going to inherit an earthly kingdom. Some people thought that there was going to be a big old chair with a crown on their head and jewels all around their neck. Some of those people thought that they was going to be in style with fine wine, maybe a two or three hump stretched camel right beside them. But Jesus had to let them know that's not the ticket that you're buying. The Bible says that Jesus had to let them know that if anyone wants to come to me, that he must hate his father and his mother, his wife and his children, yes. his brothers and his sisters, and yes, even his own life. What does that mean when Jesus says, you got to hate everybody that you're supposed to love? <laughs> Exodus itself, write this down. Exodus chapter 20, <laughs> verse 12. Speaking. I swear one of the commandments said, out of thy father and thy mother and thy days will be long. Mm -hmm. But yet Jesus seems as if he's going against the law and says that you must hate your father and your mother, your sister and your brother and your children and even your own life if you're to follow him and do this thing. Did Jesus actually mean that you should show hate towards your family members and your friends and your loved ones? What Jesus had to get them to realize, what Jesus is trying to get the crowd to realize is that it's not about hating them because they'll perceive it as hate. I want you to realize something. Your friends and your family will perceive your love for God as hate towards them. Why? Because Jesus wants the people to prioritize their life. Yes, yes. He's trying to say that if you want to follow me, you have to make God the father the first priority. Some husbands and some wives and some friends and some children and yes, some mothers and yes, some sisters and brothers, they don't want to hear that they're second to God. And so therefore, sometimes people will develop a hate for the God that you serve because you don't want to make them first in your life. But I have to say something to you. How can your children be first in your life? And how can my mother be first in my life when they were not the ones a part of life? Listen, God created my mother and God created my grandmother. God blessed me with my children. God gave me my home. God gave me my car. So if I got to love somebody first, I'm going to love the creator of all things first where blessings flow. But if it had not been for God who created my mother, where would I have been housed and created if it was not for God who made my dear mother? I want you to know something. He said you got to realize your priorities in life. Some of y'all got your priorities all screwed up. You don't understand the price of admission. I tell my family and I tell my mother and I tell my son every day, I love God more than I love you. And if I have to, I'll fire you out of my life before I give up my God. God will be there when no one else will be there. God will hold me and console me when nobody else will be there. So as you trick him behind some pastor, and as you trick him behind some other man or woman of God, you better make sure what ticket you're buying
said, if you still don't understand what I'm talking about. He said, you guys are like a builder who's not assessed the cost. He said, who will build a tower and not lay out the plans? You got to get your ass built out. You got to have your red line drawings. You got to have your engineers in place. And lo and behold, you got to have a budget. That means going to take some money. It's going to take some ingenuity and we're going to also need resources. Who on God's green earth will build a building and you don't have engineers yeah. and you don't have a plan yeah. and you don't got no money and yeah. you don't have no resources. You got to see this thing through. If you're going to follow God, yeah. you got to assess the cost that's going to cost you. You got to know there's going to be some days and there's going to be some nights. Yeah. You got to know that there's going to be some high and there's gonna be some lows. You gotta realize that everybody ain't gonna treat you right every now and then. He don't want you to quit in the middle. The Bible says that if you try to build a tower and you don't have everything together, he says you are gonna look ridiculous. Some of y'all look ridiculous because y'all don't wanna come to Bible study. Y'all don't wanna come to Sunday school. Y'all wanna tell somebody that y'all saved and y'all wanna tell somebody that y'all real, but y'all don't even know John 3, 16. And more importantly, y'all don't even know what time Bible study starts and where it's at. But you want somebody to believe that you real. Jesus said, you are not real. Bible says, if that wasn't enough, he says, suppose you are a king. He had to realize that kings have to deal with complex situations. They have to deal with either war or peace. Bible says, you got to assess that if you got 10,000 men and the other one got 20,000 men, you got to see if you're going to fight with your 10,000 or you're going to ask for peace. But no matter what, you got to deal with either war or peace. The fact of the matter is, you got to accomplish something that people are depending on you as a king. If you want the price of admission and you want to be a leader, you got to know what battles to fight and when to ask for peace. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ in your right frame of mind, you got to know when to fight for Jesus Christ and you got to know when to march for peace. Both of them require action. Both of them have a demand upon you. Both of them have people depending on you. And Jesus said, if y'all want to follow me, Y'all realize something. Not everybody's going to come up in grace and mercy. Amen. You can't hide out. You can't hide out. And some people say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go to the nursing homes. I don't want to visit the sick. I don't want to go to hospice. I don't want to go to Bible study. That's all right. But when you decide to make Jesus your choice, it's the faithful few that come to the banquet, that can receive the feast, that will find themselves up in heaven with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He said, if that's not enough, if you can't understand me as a builder, if you can't understand that you got to make God your priority, if you can't understand you have to be a wise ruler and judge over your household and family, he said, everybody at least got some taste buds. He said, it's just like cooking some food. He says, salt is good. Salt is and you need a little bit of salt in your body to retain the water that you have. The Bible says salt is good, but even if salt loses its flavor. Sometimes God got to stop talking about people and make it about abstract things so y'all can understand him very well. He said, but if salt loses its flavor, some of y'all are heavy handed on the salt sometimes. Every now and then I've been heavy handed on the salt sometimes and I have to smack my hand about that salt, but I am looking for that salty flavor. I can only imagine if I was shaking at the dinner table, my salt shaker, and the more I shook the salt, there was no flavor of the salt. And if it just left me with graininess, I don't want to chew on graininess when I eat my meat. I don't want any graininess on my vegetables. If I had to grit my teeth on graininess and no flavor, my whole plate would be ruined. God is saying that you're not going to ruin the whole plate. The fact of the matter is if you ain't got no flavor to save you, God said he's going to throw you out. That's right. He's going to throw you out. God says he looked behind him and he says, some of you jokers, I got to throw out. You want to pay the price of a mission, but you ain't got no flavor. God never said that Christians ain't got no flavor. God never said Christians ain't got no style. God never said Christians ain't got no swagger. On the contrary, when you don't sell out and when you have God in your heart, church they paying to hear 
me. It don't matter if y'all listen to me or not. Oh, God said that if you don't sell out, the people will follow you. sins. It was our transgressions. It was our iniquities that they hung him on and not his own. They beat him. They whooped him. Spit on him. Put a crown of thorns upon his head. Made a mockery of him and said, hail king of the Jews. But he said in the midst of pain, our cost for admission. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do into your hands, yes, sir. I commend my spirit. Yes, sir. He laid down his life, and he paid your cost of admission. Now you have an opportunity today. Yeah. You have an opportunity to pay the cost. Pay it just, just, just to say thank you. Yeah. Jesus paid the ultimate cost when he died for our sins, and now all we have to do is accept the invitation. <laughs> And only cost to you is maybe you're going to get ridiculed every now and then. Maybe some situations might be unfavorable to you every now and then. But by and by, Jesus took the whooping for you. He was beat for you. He died for you. You can't even pay the true cost of your own tab. Jesus paid it. He laid in a ball tomb three days and three nights and early Sunday morning. Earth shook and stone rolled away, not so he can get out, but so we can get in and see that he's alive and that he's well. Yes. He paid the cost for you today. If anybody here wants 